Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. It's Will Keller. Um, figured it's a good time to hop on and have a great conversation with my brother, Brandon Martin from seedtruth.com. It's been a long time coming. Um, I I hold you in high respect um, as a peer. And also, I learn a great deal amount, amount from you. So welcome. I'm glad you can come on and, and have a chat with me, brother. How are you doing today? I'm doing really good. Yeah, this has been a long time coming for sure. I've been excited to get on here with you, Will. Um, you know, I've been watching your work evolve and come to the table and everything has just been coming together for you and the community. And uh, I just really love the production quality you've been putting together and your presentations, you know. So I've been real inspired by that as well. So it's a it's a feedback loop, you know, like I inspired you, you inspire me. That's what we do, you know. So it's really amazing. So thank you for having me on. Oh, yeah, man. My pleasure. And you're absolutely right. It is a, a feedback loop um, of inspiration. It's to motivate and elevate. And um, my first formal presentation uh, was done at the Seed Conference, Seed 4. And um, you reached out to me and I'm like, yes, let's do it. And it was on conscious parenting. It turned out really well. And that once I did that formal presentation, I'm like, all right, I'm going to do presentations. Like I, I love the whole vibe of it. I love the process of creating slides and putting information out there. So um, maybe you can just take a few minutes about how you got started, a little bit of background just for people that are kind of new, new here. And, um, and then I want to talk about the seed conference real quick before we dive into these juicy topics. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, my background's pretty interesting. I grew up uh, kind of in an anarchist you know, lifestyle. My dad was a natural rebel, and he created a compound known as Skatopia. And so we lived on the outskirts of society. So I was definitely kept out of the propaganda for most parts. Like I didn't have a TV until I was 16, you know, and I was homeschooled myself. So I'm very autodidactic, you know. And, uh, and I also had access to, you know, very eclectic books because he was a really, uh, you know, avid reader. So, you know, he used to read me, um, you know, the satanic Bible, the satanic witch, you know, just crazy books. And he made me read 1984, Brave New World, many books like this, you know, Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit before I was even 12. So, you know, I, I had an awakening very early on, but, you know, like all of us, I, uh, reverted into hedonism in my teens, right? And it's kind of a natural process. We go through that because of our hormones and, you know, the biological impulses we have. And I really didn't have any way of, you know, solidifying all this knowledge that I had been, uh, you know, that the foundation had been laid down for me in my early years, in my youth. And then when I came across, um, I think it was, uh, it was Chimatica, Esoteric Agenda, and, um, a few other documentaries very similar to that uh, right around like 2010 to 2012 uh, that really, you know, got me motivated and interested. And then Douglas Martin introduced me to Mark Passio. And then when I got involved with his work, he just solidified all this knowledge that I had already, you know, gained about anarchism, about reading anarchist literature and about esotericism and about the occult. And it just like made this tapestry where everything was kind of disjointed for me at that point in my life. And then it, it just brought it together. And then, you know, I became very, very uh, proactive after that, you know, and he has that motivational speech, you know, he, he gets you moving. Right. And that's how mm -hmm. my dad is. My dad reminds uh, me a little bit of Mark with his motivation. Like he's very action oriented, like, you know, let's do this. You know, there is no try. You're either going to do it or you're not going to do it, you know? Yeah. Uh, so that's, it's very interesting, but I always felt like a, a deep um, bond with Mark over the years. And even though I just feel like we've been brothers for multiple lifetimes, you know, and we have some kind of deep uh, spiritual relationship. I'm sure a lot of us do. And um, so, you know, he took an interest in my work. And then I went to the Free Your Mind conference with my family. And then I was inspired by that um, to create uh, the Seed Conference. And so I did it at my own compound off of uh, my own land and did it out of my own pocket and just started putting out presentations, you know, and got a few people together and we just did it. You know, we built all these, uh, we built a pedestal, we built all these pews, we built everything, you know, from uh, DIY scrap wood and we brought people in, you know, and it was at a skate park. So people were skating, having a good time. And it was really interesting to do it that way. And, um, and from there, it just evolved and kept, you know, moving forward. 
And I just kept stepping it up every time, you know, each year. And, you know, I think the the biggest struggle I had was actually with seed four um, because, you know, I had intended to have seed four at a university because I wanted to like go into the system, go right into the education system. Cause I know a lot of people that, that go to that university. It was in Athens, Ohio, and uh, it's a pretty big university. And, um, and I wanted to put it right in their face. You know, I wanted to put the truth right out there in their face. And unfortunately, they started to have the lockdowns, the restrictions and, and all this stuff. Then they wanted to cut my seating in half and still charge me the same amount to rent the facility. And I was like, there's no way I can't cover it. You know, I can't, there's just no way I could uh, economically do that. So, you know, from that, we decided to take a step back and then eventually we did seed four and uh, got you on board and, you know, got Nathan Redad on board, got Mark Passio on board and, you know, it just turned out really well. We did it all online and that was kind of the, uh, the push to do some online conferences, which was cool. Big learning experience as well. Um, so yeah. And thank you for coming to that. Cause your presentation, I get so many compliments on, on your presentation too. That one specifically, you know, they really, and I share it with people all the time, you know, everybody that I know that has kids, I'm like, you need to listen to this. <laughs> so that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. And, and it was the first one to jump the conference off. So that was, I think that yeah. was a good, a good choice. Right. Uh, yeah. I appreciate that. And you guys have started a, uh, like a trend, right? I mean, I'm one of the organizers for the Freedom Under Natural Law um, conference, which is online. And we were inspired directly from Seed 4. And then also the Shattering the Illusion, which just happened just uh, just a, a weekend or a few weekends ago. Um, and I think virtual conferences, I think they're powerful. We can unite people from different areas. Obviously, in person is a completely different dynamic because you're eye to eye, face to face with people. And, and that's, that's great. And I highly recommend that too. But I mean, putting together a, when I was in the music industry, I would help put together these music summits and oh my gosh, expensive. There's so mm -hmm. much to do. Um, and it, it's a different, different beast in-person events versus virtual. Um, so yeah, now I commend you. We, we got a trend going and, and hopefully people can get inspired from uh, even the shattering the illusion and the funnel conference and decide to kind of unite with people and, and, and put something together. Um, so that's, that's awesome. I can relate to you on your, your childhood experiences. Um, my parents were cut from a different cloth. They were very much in aligned with um, anarchism uh, morality, objective morality. They didn't, they didn't know it at the time, but my dad literally raised me on do no harm and take no shit. I mean, those were like literal words that, that I was raised up with. And, um, so, um, so yeah, so I can relate to that. And, and I was on, you know, growing up on a ranch, I was kind of on the outside of, of culture, um, in my youth, I did go to public school and stuff like that. But, um, even my parents' friends, you know, we were on the outskirts of a suburb. They called my parents the the Beverly Hillbillies. And so, um, but I, I learned a lot from my childhood. But then getting into my teens, started getting into music, and that definitely sprung me into a little more hedonism, which looking back on it now, uh, I learned a great mm -hmm. deal about myself. And when I kind of transcend that state of mind, it was like a death a death of a state of consciousness, a level of consciousness and uh, a lot of lessons and a lot of uh, refining the ego in those days. Um, so it all depends on the person, right? I mean, this is, this is part of the, the human element. We take elements, you could take fire and wood, create a fire, and then you can add metal and humans can forge a tool from that. So, transmutation this is this is what it's all about it's all about moving energy and uh, looking at the seed conference how you just started with your own area money out of your own pocket supplies and material on your property and what what you can work with and you did what you could then and then upgrade it and and progress forward on the next the next events so that's awesome man yeah, it was really uh, interesting doing that process. And it's cool about your background. I didn't know that. Um, that's really interesting. So we can definitely relate and bond on that. Yeah. Uh, being kind of the 
black sheep of society and having kind of a family that's that's that way as well. I did go to a little bit of public school, though I will clarify that. It was more, you know, let's see, I think after sixth grade, I started doing uh, homeschool, but I did a lot of traveling too, you know, so it was hard for me to even stay in school and be able to pass because I was always, you know, I was going all over Europe, all over the States. So, you know, I got a lot of uh, experience uh, just doing a lot of traveling and I was involved in the underground punk scene and metal scene and skateboarding scene for a really long time. Um, so yeah, I got a lot of, uh, different unique perspectives, which I learned to transmute. So like when most people, like most people who know about Skatopia, when they look at me, they're like, how the heck did you turn out to be such a, a moral person coming out of such a wild place, you know? And, you know, I, I think that it's just like what you're saying. Like I just took the tools. I had some natural spiritual armor. I personally think I've been here multiple times and I've chosen to come back here to do this work intentionally because of the suffering that we're in. And I've had like past life experiences through my dreams and and through therapeutic sessions. And um, I just think I have uh, an old soul in a way, you know, and I've gained a lot of wisdom and that's why it related to me very quickly and very easily. Whereas most people probably would uh, still struggle with this because a lot of this work is what I consider to be a multi-lifetime work. Sometimes, you know, some people can take to it really quickly, but this journey is not just over, you know, so so easily as you can do it all in one lifetime, you know? And I think that's one of the problems we see in the world is people want instant gratification. Mm. You know, they want instant enlightenment, right? And I'm not saying you can't get that because I know that there are some occasions of that, but it's very rare. You know, it's extremely rare. Most people are not going to get that, especially with the condition that they're in, you know? where they've been completely, um, you know, dehumanized and completely demoralized and, you know, biologically attacked constantly, you know, ep epidigenically attacked over and over and over for tens of thousands of years, you know? So it's like, it's going to take, uh, it takes a lot of hard work. I mean, we call it the one great work for a reason, you know, and people don't get that. I mean, even just doing this live show, there's so many things that go into this and, and uh, there's a lot of work that goes into it that a lot of people would overlook, right? Mm -hmm. And I mean, when I first started doing it, I was very naive. I was like, oh, yeah, I can just, you know, get this and get that and get on it. And, and it worked. You know, you can do that with cheap mics and cheap mixing board and you can do it, right? But you have to progress. Like you're saying, you got to take a step forward. You got to, you know, uh, try to up your game, you know, and this is something I would say to that is, you know, when you're a wise person, you have a duty to share that wisdom, right? You have a moral obligation to make other people around you. I shouldn't say make, but you should inspire other people around you to, be, to become wise as well. That's what true education is about. You know, it's not about creating uh, followers. It's about creating more teachers. It's about creating more wise people in the world, more learned men and women, you know, and I think that's one of the downfalls of the education system is that it's all about obedience. You know, it's all about creating a worker class, which has been adopted by the the Prussian education system, obviously. Um, but we we've seen we've seen this even before we adopted that for hundreds of years that all of our education systems have all failed. You know, at some way or another, the only ones that succeeded were the mystery the mystery schools. You know, those were the only ones that really pr pushed us into looking at education as a way of evolving the species, a way of creating a higher type, a way of uh, not only staying in harmony with natural law and morality, but also a way of giving you purpose within society, you know, showing that you have a purpose within society to give you uh, a good understanding of how to use your spiritual currency wisely here. You know, because time is is sacred and you do have limited amount of time as far as in this form. So you should spend it wisely. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, no, yeah. Good point. You touched on so many good things. And I, I do. I make the distinguish uh, from the great work and the one great work because right. it was really big in, in the mystery traditions as well. Right. It's about the individual work then radiates to the external. Um, and when I see people, there's a lot of organizations that, um, just want to gather numbers, right? Changes in the, we 
we we create change we create change and i actually say it's the i because it's what every individual does they have to do that in uh, that internal work and then it can output in moral behavior and once more people do that then that becomes the the aggregated result um, right you see, and the form that i'm talking about is you know we can create change is protests people in in ga in, in gatherings mm -hmm. and going out to events with this state of mind people think they just go out there and hold a sign well they did their part when in reality the work is done internally that's right absolutely and well said yeah it's a it's a big issue right because you can't you don't want to identify with any type of group think right and group think the things with groups is that they're really easily controlled you know, they're much easier to control than an individual, especially an educated and an awakened individual, you know, a sovereign individual. Um, so, you know, a sovereign individual that walks into a group where it's just herd mentality and herd think, the morals of that group can be easily swayed by just a few people, maybe even one person, you know, if they have enough energy behind them, you know, if they have the right charisma, if they have the right um, persona that they can put on for the group. And that's why, like, groups have always been easily uh, used as psyops and as um, as uh, as a means to actually dictate the way that that policies are being formed in a, in a political system or in a state, because you can easily just manipulate the minds of the group. You know, see, the thing is, is that each individual isn't attacked right by the dark occult. They attack groups. You know, they attack us all as a whole. You know, they're not like specifically targeting you or me. Sometimes they do. I'm not saying that they don't, but it's more rare. They do that for specific people, you know, but they're not doing that across the board to every single person on the planet individually, you know, all at the same time. What they're doing is they're targeting groups. And in that way, they can sway those groups and move them. It's just like, it's just like uh, working on a ranch, right? You know, working with sheep or something like this. You know, it's easy to to manipulate the way the herd is going in a group. But as soon as you get that one that runs off, you know, it breaks the whole thing. And you're like, oh, you know, what am I going to do? Yeah. And uh, it can be very difficult to control that, right? Um, exactly. So groups are really easily controlled. So it is a big issue. So, yes, yeah, stay out of group politics and group identity. Because like what you're saying, getting involved in that, like going out and just raising your picket signs, that's not going to that's not going to change anything. We've seen where that's taken us before, you know, and the other thing is, is that in groups, you you get energized, you have a um, um, kind of youthful like experience of wanting to be active right but yet you haven't gained the wisdom and the responsibility to know what you need to be doing with proactivity you know you haven't gained the understanding of natural law and morality for most people right so they go out there and they want to change the system but they don't understand how the system works they don't understand the fundamental dogmatic axioms that people are believing in they don't understand causality that takes place in the mind, right? Mm -hmm. They just go out there and they're fighting the symptoms of everything. Change this policy, change this policy, right? Left and right. And they, they're applying Band-Aids to someone who is constantly reopening their wound over and over and over, not realizing that you have to stop the person in the mind from wanting to cut themselves over and over and over. You know, you don't want to just keep mass producing band-aids for that wound, right? Exactly. It's not going to solve the sickness, the psychopathology of the mind, you know? So that's a big thing. So I think you bring up, you brought up a good point there. Yeah, no, you did too with, with in, institutionalized paradigms. They, they, they project and they attack worldviews that then people identify with, right? That, like you said, right. they, it's, it's the, the group think itself. Once someone engages in the initiation process of internal development you're learning how to think and um i th i think the domestication of humanity this was kind of a topic that we we talked about Let, let's explore this a little bit because it's extra it's obvious that especially men but women as well in their own way it's all about declawing and neutering and spading um the men first because that is the men are the strength 
as well, but also attacking the, the feminine, uh, which is care and that nurturing aspect. So people are getting hit from, from both directions. And it, this is why people call them cattle or sheep, right? It, it really is domesticating human beings just like you would animals. Right. It reminds me of, uh, you know, Animal Farm, right? The book Animal exactly. Farm. I mean, that's what we're experiencing at some level. Obviously, a multitude of different allegorical stories and films. But um, yeah, that just reminds, it brings to mind Animal Farm. And yeah, the domestication of humanity has been almost perfected, I would say. You know, like they've, they've mastered this because they have occult knowledge about human psychology that they've been holding for hundreds of thousands of years. There's just no doubt about it, you know? Mm -hmm. And when you get into the occult studies of the mystery schools, you understand that, you know, this knowledge has been around for a long time. And that's really what it comes down to is understanding occult psychology, you know, not just modern psychology, because modern psychology is, is definitely not, you know, in the realms of the esoteric workings of, of real psychology you know so let's take a look at uh like carl Jung and freud right they kind of were just rediscovering what the ancient minds had discovered and perfected thousands of years before this you know yeah. they had already understood this and and the uh degradation of that knowledge and the assimilation obliteration and the uh you know institutionalizing of that knowledge and the um intentional withholding of that knowledge has been a a huge issue that has help to domesticate us because it creates a power differential between those who have the knowledge and those who do, who do not. Right. And yeah. that's the big thing. And it's, it's so easy to domesticate someone, right? You do it through fear-based mind control, right? You do it through trauma. And that's what we do. We, we keep ourselves in trauma all the time. And, uh, you know, I don't even want to point at the elite so much anymore. Right. I mean, I've been saying this for many years. It's really about all of our neighbors. It's really about ourselves. Like you said, it's about me. Where have I consented into this? Where have I done this? You know, where have I been uh, contributing to the system? So it's really the masses, you know, it's the masses of the people, because if they stood up, the chessboard would flip. You know, if we all got educated, the elites have no power. Exactly. You know, I mean, they really don't. And so, you know, I, I, I obviously point out the elites because that is true. They have the mass majority of economic power, global power with globalization, uh, geopolitics. And, you know, they have a lot of sway in the world, but it's nothing compared to the masses of the individuals. You know, it, it has no comparison. And if we had a paradigm shift, right, in mm -hmm. consciousness, and that's what this really comes down to. And you know this, you've said it many times. It's, it's all about working on your consciousness, you know, getting out of the inversion principles you know the the inverted principles of the satanic mindset and getting uh more educated more enlightened and working towards um uh, not only bettering yourself and healing your own traumas um but also uh getting proactive once you've done that you know you don't want to go out and start casting stones if you're living in a glass house obviously you know well i'm not living in a glass house anymore Right. <laughs> I don't think you are either. So we can do this. You know, we've done our work. So it's it's really important for people to understand that. And I brought that up because most of the people that are going out in the in the uh, groups, right, with the picket signs and protesting, uh, they're living in glass houses, you know, yeah. and we can see that because they fall for a left right political paradigm, you know, which I haven't said this on the air yet, but I like to say this, you know, I hear even within the community, a lot of people talking about you know, attacking the left, you know, they attack the left all the time. And, and I see that more so than attacking the right. And I understand because there's a lot more power coming from that ideology, right? At this moment, but there's no difference. And you got to realize that when you attack the left, you're bolstering the right, mm -hmm. you know, you're bolstering the other side of the paradigm, you know, and that's how people will interpret that. So you have to make sure to understand it's not just left, right. It is just government. It's just the state. You know, that's what it really is. That's what you exactly. need to attack. You know, that's the issue, you know, and, and yep. the, that's still just a symptom of the issue. But that's, you know, you at least need to get to that point where you're mm -hmm. like, OK, it's not just left and right. You know, it's it's government. It's the belief in authority. You know, <laughs> yeah, there, there is no deep state. It's just the state. 
right. <laughs> um, and and well said, accountability, accountability, responsibility. This is where it's at, and I still see this. I mean, it's extremely prevalent that people are pointing the finger at the social engineers, right? If oh, we need to get them, if we get them out of the equation, then everything's going to be good. Nope, ain't going to happen. You're never going to know who these people are. They don't have uh, social security numbers, birth certificates. They, they will be replaced. This is a, a family um, a dynasty that's been going on for thousands of years, but the power doesn't reside there. Just like you said, it resides in the individual and the individuals doing the work and the people give it the power, right? Hitler would have never done what he, what he did if the people didn't consent and followed orders and gave him power, gave his ideology power, um, because they're the ones that are actually performing the actions. Um, so yeah, man, I mean, well said, we have a question real quick from our good friend, Brandon Spencer. Is Brandon familiar with the Egyptian? How do you say that word? Uh, Jed. It's just Jed. I, I Jed believe. Killer. Yeah. Yeah. And what it represents. It's symbolic of. Um, uh, I've run into it in my studies. Um, I'm not as fluent in in that as the Greek pillars of um, you know, what are they? Uh, the Ionic pillar, the Corinthian pillar, and the Doric pillars, and then there's even more than that. So, you know, I couldn't give you an exact breakdown of that on the air right now, but I, I've, I have ran into that in my studies and it is very important. I do know that. And Doug, Doug Martin probably would know about it. <laughs> he probably could break it down. So <laughs> Douglas is great when um, yep. at Anarchadelphia, I met you briefly, but I didn't get that much time face to face to to converse with you. But I, I spent a lot of time with Douglas um, and your grandma and beautiful woman. And Douglas was just, I mean, he's a wealth of information. So yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if he knew that. But uh, this this makes me want to transition into um, symbolism and etymology and words. Because with all my work and presentations, I like to simplify it, bring it down several notches. And you can do that by just, I mean, even defining words. Um, relativity has just sunk its claws in all aspects of life people think everything is relative including words which is the complete opposite of what a definition is and i understand words can change and it's good to know that and talk about that but there is an etymology an origin of a word taking it from infinite possibilities to the the finite right absolutely uh, uh that's well said um, yeah, it's interesting because it's the thing itself doesn't change. That's how I look at it. It's an objective thing. It's an objective truth, right? So whenever we break down a word, we can clarify what it happens to be in a uh, more eclectic fashion or a more precise fashion. So it's not necessarily like when I talked to, you know, I gave that presentation, um, uh, at the funnel conference, which is uh, on green language and was on language in general in a way. And I talked about etymology in it. So what I was trying to say in that is that, you know, the definition, the clarity of that, we enhance the clarity of a word by, by understanding something more by, let's say, let's say I have bad eyesight, right? And then I use glasses to see more clear, right? To see what is in front of me more clearly. Well, that's what I was trying to say with that. So um, yeah, the relative notions of, you know, bringing out, you know, definitions, I, I can't, the, the hypocrisy in that, the contradiction in it, in the logic, it just doesn't make any sense to me. I've always, you know, understood that definitions are extremely important when you're trying to communicate, you know, and obviously understanding is very important as well. But if people can't understand the words they're using based upon some kind of mode or formula, then miscommunication is obviously the result of it's going to be the result no matter what, right? Mm -hmm. So etymology helps us to really make clear of the origins. And most likely you're going to find that the original definition of the word is more clear than the ones that we're using now because our language have, has been targeted and utilized to create discourse between people, you know, and that's one of the biggest things because in any type of warfare and 
and you know, let's not mince words here. We are in a spiritual warfare here. You know, we we have a war against our consciousness on an individual level and and on a collective level. And um, you know, any anything like in warfare and in warfare tactics and strategy, you're gonna try to create a discord within communication, right? So if you look at any war throughout history, they're always trying to disrupt communication, you know, because communication with clear understanding creates spa, uh, creates strong camaraderie between the individuals where they have they have a wall between them where they can communicate tactics, they can communicate strategies, you know, they can organize and formulate their plans much better. And if you can disrupt that, then, you know, you're cutting off any type of strength that two individuals that come together to fight tyranny have, you know. So we do need to understand our words. We do need to understand how our words have been obfuscated in many different ways and, and um, you know, how they've been intentionally, um, you know, how they've attacked it so much that it's de-evolved to such a degree that we're pretty much just speaking in tongues is how I, I would put it, you know. I mean, yeah. we really have a semant like most people argue semantics, you know, like everybody's arguing about semantical issues all the time. It's like if I if I'm saying this and I'm saying natural law, you know, and then someone else is coming in and saying God's law, but that person cannot have the pattern uh, recognition to say to understand that the same thing based upon the, the results of that thing, you know, are, are are identical. It's like, you know, what are you talking about here? It's just a mm -hmm. semantical issue. You're just using another term for the same thing that I'm talking about. You know, I've literally had arguments like that where people were like, no, I'm not, I'm not talking about natural law. I'm talking about God's law and that's it. Everything you're talking about is satanic. And I'm like, no, like literally explain what you mean by God's law. And then they go through it. And I'm like, that's exactly what I'm saying about not natural law. It's the same thing. You yep. know, it's yep. the same, it's the same thing. Like, what are you doing? Like, and they're like, they still argue with, you know, mm -hmm. and it's, it's because they're identified, they're eagerly identified with the terminology rather than the actual meaning, you know, that's the thing. And that's what I always say about like anarchism and stuff. You know, I care about the meaning of anarchy. I'm not identified with the term anarchy, right? It's the meaning that's important. It's the idea of freedom that's important. It's not about the term. You can use whatever term you want. I don't really care as long as the result is the same, mm -hmm. you know, that's the most important part is that we get that kind of condition, which is freedom in the absence of slavery, you know? So that's the main thing that I look at is that the meaning has to be consistent and it has to um, be in alignment with objective truth, obviously. Yeah, for sure. I mean, words have meaning and meaning leads to purpose. Um, mm -hmm. So all these labels in the world, they're just labels until the meaning is understood and the actions reflect the meaning which actions could correlate to purpose, your purpose to, um, to perform energy, act, act ion, action. Um, so yeah, and your presentation was just phenomenal, man. You, you, you condensed a lot of information in that, in that short period of time, and it was great. So I highly recommend people go check that out, Green Language, um, also on your website and your channels and the Funnel website as well. Um, but I mean, you can gain such a higher awareness just by looking at words. I read my etymology books just for shits and giggles because I'm just blown away when I come across words and I, I, I check out their origins and the breakdowns and, and then go and reference it online and see the differences even on something that I've used for a while, which was, um, uh, Eddie online, which, uh, used to be a really solid etymology website. Um, it has changed a mm -hmm. little bit since they came out with the app. I've seen some of the words change and, um, and, and uh, quite a bit of inaccuracies as well. So it's good to have multiple sources and, and then also understand, um, how certain languages are put together because there's context in, in these languages as well, like Latin and Greek. Um, that people need to understand. Absolutely. It's funny you brought up uh, the etymology online site because uh, yeah. 
I know which one you're talking about. And I watched it change in the day, like live, you know, mm -hmm. I went and was looking at a word and then I went back like maybe 15, 20 minutes later and the entire definition they had on there had been changed. Yep. And it was just so wild. And I was blown away by, you know, how quickly that had happened. And then ever since then, I've just seen a downgrade of the clarity of the etymology within that site. So I used to use it a lot. But yeah, etymology books is what you really want, right? Um, you, you really do want to have a good, firm understanding of, of your language, the roots of it. A lot of people will bring up what's called the etymological fallacy. And they'll argue this, you know, I've heard this even against like Mark Passio's work. Right. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is that it's, it's a very complicated fallacy because when someone solely bases the, the meaning of all of their, let's say their premise on an etymology, right. Where like maybe that etymology wasn't as clear as it is today. Cause we can have that transition. Right. So let's say in the past, it wasn't as clear and then today we have advanced in, in this etymology, and today it's more clear than what it used to be. So if you base your entire concept on the old one, it's going to be less clear than what the new one would be. But the problem is, is that they use this as a dismissive technique to dismiss the ones that are more clear in the past, that are more clear in their roots and in their meaning and uh, more aligned with objective truth. Right. Mm. So they use this as a dismissive argument to try to make you seem like you're not your arguments are moot, you know, that your arguments don't stand on their own, you know, so they'll use that. And I've had people attack me about that. And I know a lot of people have attacked Mark over that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I brought that up so that I call that the etymological fallacy fallacy, you know, <laughs> because it's a fallacy to do that, to to try to say, oh, because you're doing you're using etymological words that. Uh, you're, that you're basing your concept off of, let's say like anarchy, um, that your entire argument now is just moot and you don't, it has no substance and no value because the, like you're talking about, it's, it's all relative, right? So they go into this relativistic idea and this kind of postmodern thinking where, you know, they don't even believe in objective truth, but somehow they've come to the objective truth, quote unquote, <laughs> that everything's relative, right? So yeah. there's, a, there's a fallacy within that. There's a fundamental illogical contradiction there when people are like, oh, yeah, I know this to be relative and it's all like truth is relative. But yet, isn't that supposed to be based on an objective truth? How did you come to understand that? You know, so it's a it doesn't hold up. It's a self-defeating argument. Mm -hmm. you know? Or yeah. we say that truth doesn't exist. Right. Is it true that truth doesn't exist? Well, Obviously, you can only go one of two ways. Either it is, meaning that there is such thing as truth, or it's not, meaning that there is such thing as truth. Both ways you go, you end up at truth. It doesn't matter where you go. You know? Yeah. Oh, for sure. And I actually got this, got that um, the comment just about four or five times recently in the last in the last day or two. Truth doesn't exist. No such thing as natural law. Mm -hmm. Truth doesn't exist. It's like, okay, then you're on MySpace and and my name's Jessica and and you're Bob and actually you don't exist and I'm I'm reading pictures. It's like you gotta bring it down. Yes, you can we can observe, we can all see that there's a cloud in the sky, right? I mean, we, we're on a computer right now, we're using the internet, we're on restream, we're Brandon and Will are having this conversation, and these are just basic crude examples of actual things that are based in truth. Correct. We are having a conversation right now on Restream, but yet people want to take it into this other dimension. And um, it, it actually has a lot of um, religious overtones to it, right? Because um, people don't understand uh, how the nature of reality operates, even on the elementary level. And they they don't they don't think deeply. This is where, and I know you've talked about philosophy, uh, where philosophy philosophy comes into play. And sure, I mean, there's many categories, but you can simplify philosophy by just having mm -hmm. that internal dialogue with yourself about big questions, right? Right. The difference between religion and philosophy is your philosophy. You're asking yourself these questions, the big questions and religion, you have to ask permission and you might not even get an answer. Um, so it's it, it, relativity. It's definitely a big issue. 
Um, and it just, and actually revisionist history is where right. I was going to take it. Right. I mean, we see, we talked about etymology online and, um, it's clear to me cause I've been checking this site out for a few years that as soon as the app came online, obviously, um, some company sponsored it, got some money, provided an app, and now everything has changed. And we've seen this countless times, um, with publication companies and, you know, that, that take on the Rockefellers that buy up, um, publishing companies and, and, mm -hmm. you know, take books off the market or, or revise them. I mean, there's countless examples. Yeah. It's interesting. You bring up that I, uh, I like to buy, you know, original hardback copies of a lot of my books, even if I have them in PDF and I I'll buy like a, a softback too, you know, the, the republished version. And then if you compare them, you can see like where there's missing pages, there's missing, you know, content from the republished version where they've censored it. You know, they literally have taken out, taken out a portion of the book and, you know, it's, I mean, it's all over the board and, and you're completely dead on about that. Yeah. The philosophical issue as well is that philosophy in its pure form is like what you're saying. It's a dialogue with yourself. It's a dialogue with nature to ask fundamental questions about the nature of, of your own mind and the nature of the universe and to discover objective truth because it just means, you know, the love for wisdom. Um, that's what the word philosophy means. So it's about coming and wisdom is about living in harmony with objective truth and doing right action, you know, uh, correct conduct, you know, and to do correct conduct, you have to have an objective truth to base that off of. You can't have right action if there is no objective truth. That's what a lot of people don't realize. So even the people that say it's all relative, at some level, they don't even live in accordance with that, you know. Like some people will still have some type of moral compass to a certain degree, most of them broken because it's based on moral relativity, but sometimes that relativity is correct one time of, of the day, right? It's like a they'll, clock. They'll right? agree Bro with you clock. that, oh, that yeah. murder isn't good. It's it's, like right, <laughs> exactly. Right, right. Um, so <laughs> it's really interesting. But yeah, there's a philosophical um, issue too because a lot of people have these arguments like, you know, that have come from philosophy where we have concluded on the objective truth about these things. And we see this throughout history uh, with the great, you know, philosophers of our times. And, uh, but they're still arguing over the same thing, is my point. It's a constant argument, you know, and then you get people who, you know, get into nihilism or, you know, like, uh, let's say Nietzscheanism, you know, and Nietzsche has some great stuff, but, you know, he takes you away from what you really need mm -hmm. ultimately you know he'll stimulate your mind but he doesn't get you to the fundamental of the principles and and the real epistemology and a lot of stuff that you really need to make a uh, a, a better person out of yourself and to create correct conduct in the world and to gain meaning in the world so a lot of people become nihilistic obviously or or atheistic you know with a lot of these things and they just argue constantly they just want to argue over all these points rather than looking uh, within and looking at nature and understanding the discovery process. An example of this would be like the allegory of Plato's cave, right? The allegory of Plato's cave is a great allegory. You know, it can help you to understand how to get to objective truth. The Matrix movie is kind of a play off the allegory of the uh, Plato's cave, right? Mm -hmm. But yet people can take that and warp it and manipulate it to make it seem like that what you're experiencing here is completely all relative. So people will look at even the matrix allegory and and take it and warp it and be like, oh yeah, this is all just a big game, a big simulation. It doesn't matter, you know? Mm -hmm. Like nothing here really matters because this is the cave, right? And they don't realize that this is the cave and it's actually the surface as well. It's both, you know? The, yeah. the cave is actually, the projections on the cave wall are actually politics, you know? It's government. That's what all that is it's the illusions you know and then you climb out and you see the sun the sun of truth and life and and growth and uh and that's that's the real world you know that's here too it's spirit in the flesh you know mm -hmm. so people take these things and they twist it to their own narrative is my point because they're they are fundamentally flawed in their logic and their intuitive capabilities and their pattern recognition so yeah, philosophy is a really interesting thing. I actually coined a, a term a while back, and you might like this, and the people listening might like this, you know, because 
the Greeks define love in many different ways. So you have like eros, philos, agape, or agape, right? And they even go up to like seven in, in later traditions, right? But we'll stick with those three for, for an example. But we have agosophy, right? Which would be a higher form of philosophy. So it's agape or agape. It's universal love for wisdom. So philos is a personal level, you know, um, um, a platonic level of love, right? Mm -hmm. So then you have uh, a step above that, which is an intimate love with the universe. So universal love. So I just take take the word, you know, agape, combine it with Sophia, you know, Sophie, agosophy, you know? So it's this new, it's an advancement of philosophy, you know? Excellent. So it's not just for me personally, it's for the entire universe, you know? It's the love for universal knowledge. It's the love for the universal mystery. Mysteries. It's love for uh, creating things in the universe and stewarding the universe and helping the universe and being in alignment with the one great spirit and being in alignment with your purpose here, you know, to create freedom and, and to advance the species. Because that's all ultimately what it is. We have to evolve our own species, you know, and that's why they don't want us to have our own education. That's why they want to keep us dumbed down, domesticated, you know, docile. You know, they want to keep us dumb. <laughs> yeah. No, and we do I, it to I, ourselves absolutely. too. I, I want to add that we do it to ourselves also. So we got to realize that. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the thing. You know, it, we're consenting to slavery. I mean, you're not, I'm not, right? Mm -hmm. This is why we're doing the one great work of educating people uh, to, to do and inspire people to do that internal work. Um, but the majority of people in the aggregate are consenting to the current human condition. Um, the ego steps in, right. And immediately puts up blocks and, and these blocks are, it's so one can't look at themselves when they see a movie like the matrix, um, or Plato's cave, right? I mean, these are great allegory, um, allegories of what is actually going on in, in a way, right. And, and the hero's journey is a great archetypal mm -hmm. story, um, that we, we see in movies all the time right and people resonate with that they'll watch a movie uh like v for vendetta and you know root for the the good guys that are taking down the system but yet can won't apply it to actually the actual natural world and our current human condition the ego puts that block in even though subconsciously i think they that intuition knows that um something is amiss. that was something that i touched on in my in my presentation um, but the ego definitely has a good hold on people. And, and I'm not one of these guys that says that, that we have to kill our ego. You can't do that in this reality. Mm -hmm. The ego is here. The ego cannot die and, and you breathe as well. Right. But, um, and a dominant ego where the ego is in full control definitely restricts one's inner sight to, uh, to evaluate themselves. And, and look at themselves deep within and see these blocks. Right. Yeah, I'd like to talk about the ego. Um, I agree with you. The ego, the idea of the ego needing to be killed or ego death is a misnomer. And it's propagated by the New Age movement, obviously. Mm -hmm. And it's a misunderstanding of your own psychology. The ego is a tool. And it's a very useful tool when it's in its proper position. The ego simply means I. And it's about self-identification. It's about individualization. So... If I didn't have my ego as an example of this, I couldn't determine the difference between me and the things around me. I would have no comparison because I don't, I can't identify with myself. So let's say I'm standing under a tree, you know, I wouldn't be able to understand that I am not the tree. And there's a reason why you have to understand that. And there is a biological and conscious consciousness reason for that. It's because of protection. Okay. And I know a lot of people won't like that, but it's true because if a, if that tree decides to fall on you, not the sides, but if it happens to fall on you, mm -hmm. right, you need to be able to protect yourself in order to survive so that you can continue to develop and grow and evolve and things like this. But if you think you're the tree, it doesn't matter if the tree falls on you because you're the tree. You're falling with the tree. You are the tree. It doesn't matter. So if it falls on you, you know, and you die, it, it there's no point in it, right? So, but we don't want to take it so far that we separate ourselves from nature, obviously, right? So there has to be a balance between understanding the individualization process that I am, you know, 
I am not the tree, but also that I am connected to the tree, you know? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That, that healthy balance. And we, we can look at the, the current human condition, right? We, we see, like we were just talking about relativism and people identifying with whatever they want, right? So mm -hmm. it's this misdirection that is fully disconnecting people from that higher self and the, 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 uh, the interconnectedness of nature and source and the natural universal spirit, um, which it, it's just, it's mind blowing the shit that we see nowadays, uh, with, with people that <laughs> what they identify with and that disconnect. Oh, um, and I tell people, you know, speaking truth, there is a level of acceptance, not accepting, um, slavery or violence, but accepting that you are, you can do what you can do, but yet you can't force someone to change internally. Right. So, and what that means is to constantly, um, do that self synthesis, the deep shadow work of bettering yourself, right? It's a continual process where you can find, um, um, better ways to be creative and communicate um, information and, and truth to people. Um, so I see a lot of people, especially in the quote unquote truth freedom movement. Um, they definitely, there's no hope. We can't change. You can't change someone. So if I can't change my, my dad or my mom, then I can't change anyone and they give up. Right. So this, this nihilistic mindset that people are in um, when in reality, the the correct thought process is well how can i change myself to communicate better to influence or inspire um more effectively and like you said in the very beginning of this right we're in this for the long haul mm -hmm. thousands and thousands of years of slavery we're not going to do this in one lifetime but yet it's a stepwise progression so we can pass the torch to the younger generation and and they can take and, and hopefully have um a a better a head start or um i mean how you were raised that's great with your father you know giving you uh, uh extremely aware information i mean that's awesome i'm trying to uh, be that same type of model to my daughter um but not shelter her from the world speak right. plainly and truthfully but also um truly educate as best as possible Right. I just noticed we both got dogs. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I can see your dog in the background. Yeah, she's playing with something. I don't know what she got a hold of, but um, yeah, I agree with you. The old quote from Gandhi is be the change you want to see in the world, you know? So that's yeah. what it has to be. Everybody's seeking to change everybody else without changing themselves. And it all starts with the self. If you can't see it within yourself, then how do you expect it to see it within the external or within the other worlds, you know, or the other people, I mean. And, um, so the, the, the hidden treasure is within the self, right? So know thyself and you will know the universe and, and the gods, you know, that's the old, uh, uh Oracle quote, right? Yeah. Delphi. Delphi. So, yeah. so yeah. that's really important to know thyself. And that's what this all comes down to is more self-knowledge, more self-awareness, and then being able to be activated with that. Um, so yeah, I think it's really important to understand that you know, relativism is a huge downfall in the ability for the species to evolve itself because it leaves everything up in the air to be at the whims of everybody's perception, you know? And if it's at the whims of everybody's perception, then there's no learning methodology. There's no point in learning. There's no point in doing anything, you know? There's no point in even existing or breathing or, you know, there's no point for you to even survive. You know, there's no point for anything in the world. And that's one of the biggest issues I do see, like you talked about, is that not only that people don't believe in meaning or purpose in the world, but they, if they do, if they happen to be in the truth community and stuff like this, they're, they're kind of activated. They do have some knowledge. They do feel powerless, right? So they feel powerless and they don't know how to approach the problems at hand, right? They don't know how to approach the inequities and inequities that are plaguing the world at this point, right? Mm -hmm. And all the suffering that's going on. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to show you and trying to show everybody that you do have the power. You know, the illusion is that you don't have the power. You know, that's the ego. That's the ego block. 
you know, that makes you not do anything. That's the fear. And that's what the dark occultists rely upon is for you to believe that either there's no purpose and everything's relative or that even if it's not relative and there is purpose, it doesn't matter because how can I create change in the world? You know, and they, you always hear this, like everybody's like, no, one man can't create change in the world. So that, you know, that always, you know, one person can't change the world, right? That old, uh, that old saying. And it's like, no, no, that's how it all starts, you know, is by one person. And then the world changes, you know, it always starts with the one person. Yeah. So I, I think that's what this whole, the, the whole uh, show has been about, the individual, the individualization, you know, a exactly. lot of people take it, uh, take it to the extreme too, where you can't be so individualized that you can't connect with other people. That's what I was talking about with the tree, right? You don't want to be so individualized that you can't connect with other people's suffering, you know, because if you can't do that, then it's just freedom for you and it doesn't matter for other people. And that's not true freedom. You know, true freedom is a relationship between all of us. You know, it's if I'm not free, then you're not free. If you're not free, I'm not free. You know, that's the thing. Yeah. But we also want to stay out of the victimization idea as well. So we have to stay in our power of sovereignty empowerment, our spiritual empowerment. You know, we got to be spiritual warriors here, you know? So I'm not a slave, but I'm in a condition of slavery. You know, you could say I'm a slave. They can say I'm a slave, but I'm going to tell them to their face. I am not a slave and I'm not going to back down because I am not inherently a slave. You know, I'm inherently a free sovereign being in this universe and you're not going to take my freedom. You're not going to usurp it anymore. And I'm not going to allow that to, you know, be passed down to the next generation to, on the progeny. You know, so I'd rather have the suffering hit me than progeny, right? I'd yeah. rather take the blunt of that than pass it down. And that's what most of these parents do. They're like, oh, you know, I don't need to worry about this. And what happens is that the the failures of them get passed down to the next generation. You know, the failures of our parents get passed down to us. And obviously none of us are perfect. So we're going to have some failures that get passed down. So don't beat yourself up about that either, you know, but we do the best we can. And you can't just sit back and do nothing. You know, you don't want to be lackadaisical. You don't want to be lazy or cowardly, right? Because yeah. that's what we really see is cowardness. You know, it's it's just everybody's cowards. You know, they're the cowardly lion and they have not been anointed to the kingship, you know, of themselves. So exactly. it's a big, it's a big issue. Yeah, man. Well said. I mean, this is what the social engineers want to do with how you were mentioning relativism. It ultimately it severs communication, communication from each other and ourselves and the natural world. Right. Because, I mean, this is what they don't want to happen. They don't want that connect that connect. So you commune and communicate with nature, uh, which is all encompassing. And, and, uh, and yeah, I mean, poof, you, you said some, some great <laughs> shit, how I feel and how I've been feeling for a while. It's like, if you're not talking about freedom, what it is, how do we achieve it? Then what the fuck are you doing? Because right. I mean, first, obviously someone needs to, uh, recognize the problem and make a correct diagnosis, which mm -hmm. means by way of knowledge, but then activate and get on the battlefield, which the battlefield right now is, is creating content while we can, and also going out in, you know, local communities and talking with people. Sure. But you want to be effective. Um, one of my, my greatest, um, shadows that, that haunts me and I accept is when my daughter gets older, she's nine now. And I want her to, if she looks me in the eye when she's older and says, dad, what did you do to contribute to freedom when I was younger or in the world? Right. I want to prove it, not just say it. Oh, well, I did this. I did that. I want to prove it. And when we're doing conversations like this, when we're creating content effectively, you're immortalizing a message and you're putting it out to the world that can be accessed when we're gone. Right. I'm, I'm pretty much, uh, I'm pretty much creating like a video diary that I can leave my daughter. If so, if, if I might move on from this world, you know, prematurely, mm -hmm. which hopefully not, I I'm in it for the long haul, but we'll see. It all depends on what the beard thinks. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, but yeah, I mean, doing it, the, the kids, the children can't, and a lot of people say, Oh, it's all about the children. And it is, but the children are not going to, 
uh, remedy the situation. The right. parents are, but the parents need that awareness. Um, so it's, it's definitely, it is a war. It's a war for souls and it's, it's definitely serious. And, um, I, I try to stay grounded and centered and I, I recommend this for people as well. Don't let the social engineers, don't give them that satisfaction of corrupting and, and having an, an internal, your internal ecology, just full of chaos. That's what, that's part of the, the, the whole gimmick too, right? Oh, as soon as you get gain awareness of what's going on in the natural world, um, then you're, you won't be able to handle it because you don't have the tools internally in your psychology and, and your, and your emotions and, and physically as well, that you'll just shrivel up inside. So this is why, um, the individual and the internal ecology is so important. So that way we can prove it externally. Absolutely. And well said, and that's powerful what you said about, you know, what, what am I going to show my daughter or my child, you know, where I've, um, you know, applied my, myself in this world and how I've helped the world grow into freedom. Most people would never ask themselves that, you know, so just for you to say, say that and state that, that just shows how amazingly conscious you are as a parent, you know, so I thank you for being a conscious parent in that, in that arena, because we need more people to ask those questions, you know, like, Hey, yeah. what, how am I going to, you know, approach that if my child, let alone if your child ever does that because you socially, you know, engineered them yourself or uh, you, uh, you know, made them docile, a little puppet just to follow you around like another slave, you mm -hmm. know, because it is, it's just like a Russian doll syndrome of slavery, right? It just yeah. trickles down through the hierarchy. So generational really mind control. Yep. Generational mind control. That's right. So another thing I like to say about the relativism is that a lot of people, especially religious people, they they don't really consider what happens here that matters very much to them because they believe they're going to go to another place, you know. Mm. And this is a what's called an eschatological issue, okay? Which is what that means is the final resting place of the soul. Final things is what it, what it really means. So eschatology is the study of like you know the afterlife or final things and things like this. So. Uh, they they think it matters to a certain degree, but then ultimately they really don't because they don't ever stand up and do anything about what's going on, you know? So if you're not actually taking action to change the world, do you really care? Can you really say you know what's going on? Can you really say you understand it? And can you really say that you actually care, you know? Because mm -hmm. you don't. I don't think so. You know, you may claim that, but it really ha you don't have gnosis of that. You know, you don't have a deep understanding, an intimate understanding of the suffering that we're all going through, you know, and that's why you're not doing anything. So that's why we need more solutions. You know, I, this is a big issue as well, is that people expect me or you to have all the solutions to all the problems in the world because we're trying to change the world on an individual level. It's like, no, that's that's another straw man argument. You know, it, it you're trying to put me into a position where I cannot defend my arguments by saying, since you're not a nuclear engineer, how are you going to deal with the nuclear power plants when you're in a stateless society? It's like, no, there's other there's other people, you know, the other people who have those skills. That's what the roundtable is about. You know, you talk to them about that. They'll have the solutions to that. I don't have a solution to that. You know, I'm not I'm not meant to have all the knowledge on all areas in the entire world. You know, I'm not omnipotent. You know, I'm not omnipresent. I'm not a God. That's the whole point. Everybody wants to be God here. And then when you go to try to change the world into a more free world and you're trying to help them, you're trying to actually help those people who are enslaved. They're like, oh, well, if you can't solve all the other problems of the world when we're free, then, um, then uh, you know, I'm not going to listen to your arguments. You know, why would I ever listen to you? Because you can't figure out how to do this one thing over here where you, you've never studied that at all. And it's mm. like, okay, it's a fallacy, you know? Yeah. It's a straw man, straw man fallacy. And you're trying to dismiss the entire argument. And what sucks is that it keeps people enslaved because people are more worried about the utilitarianism and pragmatism of like how the system would work and I know I've talked about this recently on many shows, but they're more worried about that rather than actually achieving freedom. Freedom has to come first, you know? All those other things, we've already, we already know how to do those things, you know? Infrastructure, organization, you know, all these things that we'll have, 
without coercive governments, without slavery, you know? We already understand how to do those things. So it's not like that knowledge is going to change. For example, uh, magically, because we're free, we're all going to lose the ability or the knowledge of how to take care of the roads, you know? <laughs> yeah, like, exactly. really, I mean, seriously, how ignorant are you, you know? Like, magically, we're just not going to take care of our own roads, which I have to personally use to to get to places, you know? So I have an incentive to want to take care of them. And then if a community comes together to work on them without a third party stealing from us to get that done, which they usually don't get it done anyways, somehow they're just going to magically be destroyed, right? They're just going to magically fall apart. And it's like, no, actually, they're falling apart now because we're living in tyranny. <laughs> you know, that's the problem exactly. because that system of taxation not only is unethical and immoral, but it's inefficient to deal with local community issues, you know? And it's inefficient to deal with collective issues as well, because no matter what, the evil always has within it the seeds of its own destruction. It cannot continuously perpetuate because within itself there is a solution to it, and it's going to destroy itself. It's going to start to devour itself. And you see this. It's always, it's like hierarchies fighting other hierarchies constantly, and the dark occult are up here just watching it right mm -hmm. so you got all these towers coming up and devouring each other right but they never get to the pinnacle and i wanted to point out one more thing i know this is a long rant but you said something no, really good. you said something really important that i always talk about with people and it blows them away and i'm like you were talking about you know um that if you took out these these elite people that what would happen right well, you have hundreds of thousands, millions of people in the same mindset, and they would will willfully take up those positions of authority. They would willfully. I know people who would be like, oh, yeah, I would love to be a rich, you know, pedophilic elite person. You know, I've never met anybody who said they wanted to be a pedophile, obviously, but you get my point because of the yeah. money, because of the, the standard of living, their living would be increased. They can do more things, obviously, because of this, but people would uh, willfully. And without hesitation, take up those positions, right? And the other thing that you mentioned is that you'll never know these people. And it's true. They don't have social security cards. Even their bloodlines are completely obscure now. You know, you think that you can track their bloodlines now? You're crazy. They have such advanced technologies. There's no way you're going to track these family bloodlines anymore. Yeah, you know, no you think way. They, yeah, you think, you think that you're going to find these people at your local freaking Walmart? Or a shopping center? No, you're not. You know, these people have everything set up for them. They own all that. And then also you think it's all about money as well, that this world, that the, that the elites only want this because it's about money and getting more rich. No, no, it's not. That's low level. You know, that's underneath them. They don't need that. They print the money. You know, they make the money. They don't need that. So even if a society collapses and the currency goes away and devalues itself to zero, it doesn't matter because the, the next totalitarian society that comes up, they'll print that money. It doesn't matter to them because they have such control and they understand this stuff. They're not doing this for money. They're doing this for the control of the population. That's it. They're doing it to make us slaves perpetually, to perfect slavery. And that's it, you know, and people still think it's an economic issue and people still in the conspiratorial movements think that they're going to be able to trace down these, uh, these bloodlines. And I'm not saying don't do your work into the bloodlines because that's important, like the 13 Illuminati bloodlines and, you know, anything like that, you know, that's good. And I get the idea of wanting to bring an individual to justice because we do, we, we have an incentive to want to, you know, like actually create, you know, justice in the world. And we want to bring justice in the world, but don't get, don't confuse that with thinking that you're going to find these people. There's no know? change that lies there as well. No, no, no. There's no change there. You know, absolutely right. It's not getting to causality. It's just a symptom. They are a symptom as well. You know, they're a symptom of that mindset of the dogma of the, the false beliefs. All, all the sorcerer has to do is to give you his mindset, right? Exactly. That's, and that's what they do. You know, they just put out a little bit here and there, and then we take it and run with it. They inject a little toxicity into the, the society, and we take it and run with it, and then we fluoridate our own water. You know, we poison our own air. You know, we spray ourselves like bugs constantly. Yeah. So, 
the mindset <laughs> is holographic. It's self-similar. Like you right. said, the sorcerer gives the 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 people um, their own mindset, and then the people will do whatever they want. Um, again, the domestication of humanity, uh, which majority of people, they identify with the abuser. They identify with their slavery, and then they justify it. Like, oh, well, human beings can't create roads. We need the state to do that. Um, so the state, mm -hmm. ultimately, that right. system is narcissistic. It's just like a narcissistic uh, uh, abuser, really a parasite, right? Because mm -hmm. like you said, it's not about money. It's about souls and the energy that that the soul creates that they feed off of. So that it ultimately is like a parasite living at another's expense. Right, right, right. So they can play God. Yeah, they got us believing in social Darwinism, you know? I mean, that's what this is all about. Survival of the most ruthless, right? Mm -hmm. Survival of the most psychopathic. So they they build in an, an incentive for the population to be the most psychopathic that they can be. You know, we breed yep. secondary psychopaths throughout society. I mean, you know, I mean, a great allegory of a psychopathy would be like the Batman movie, right? Mm -hmm. With the Joker and, and Batman, you know, they're both kind of borderline psychopaths, you know? Yeah. It's a really interesting concept when you get into that. And and Batman himself kind of represents the archetypal Satan, you know? And then what happens when Batman saves everybody? He brings in the police force. You know, there's always escalation of more order followers. You know, you think he's the hero, right? And you're like, oh yeah, you know, he's a great detective. And don't get me wrong, I like Batman, you know? I'm not saying I don't like Batman because I, as a kid, grew up with Batman and it was always my favorite, my favorite hero out of all of them. But, um, uh, it's probably because of the dark stuff that comes along with it because he represents the shadow, the dark side of ourselves, you know? Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. And, but uh, the point is, is that he brings in the the police state, you know? It always increases yep. in the police in Gotham City, right? So it's always escalation, you know? One guy, one, you know, the Joker comes up, he battles the Joker, and then the police come in, and then they try to take out Batman, and then police is, the, start working with Batman again. And it's always this crazy, you know, battle of escalation between these psychopathic parasites, you know, and he's not really getting to the root of the issue. Batman isn't right. He doesn't ever get to the root of the problem. You know, he's not willing to go all the way, even though he's supposed to be the world's greatest detective. You know, he's, he's not willing to go all the way and understand natural law and understand, um, causality, which lies in the mind, you know, exactly. Yeah, so I, I wanted to bring that up because I, I think that's pretty interesting. And I made a meme about that years ago about Batman. He was standing in front of all these police cars and it says, uh, I think it was the R Rise of the Dark Knight or something like that. And I said, uh, Rise of the Police State, <laughs> you know? Yeah, so. <laughs> it's a good, it, it's a great allegory and, and a lesson. You know, a lot of, there's a lot of content out there, right? And I always tell people, Whoever you're following, wherever the source of your information is, what it, what principles, what is their core message? Because right. if it has to do with anything with the state, right, then it's it's bullshit. Yeah. Um, and and that doesn't mean that you throw information, throw the baby out with the bathwater. Right. Right. Um, but for an example, and I'll say it like Dell Bigtree, I've mentioned this before, right? His ultimate solution is safer vaccines. When the correct response is to be a vaccine um, abolitionist, just like right, right. I'm an ab abolitionist for government, right? Because mm -hmm. it's inherently immoral. Um, so it's all about that core message. And a lot of these, uh, a lot of these, um, these groups or, or information, they always kind of give you the runaround, and it, and it ends at some type of political solution where government is just reinstated so. right right yeah we always see that in all the, in a lot of these films and and um you know movies and even comic books and all kinds of stuff it's always about promoting that government i mean if you look at the comic book industry you see how much propaganda came from that mm -hmm. you know go back to world war one and world war two and you can see first of all they got extremely censored at that time period you know, where a lot of the comics that were standing against, um, you know, the state and stuff like that were completely destroyed. And then you have a promotion of these very sanitized versions of these heroes and stuff. And then it's all status propaganda, you know, all of it yeah. constantly throughout the history. And um, so art is really important because art 
can either destroy a nation or it can, you know, enhance a nation, right? It can destroy a society or it can evolve a society because I'm not saying it. It's, it's a tool, you know, I'm just saying it's mm -hmm. a tool is what I say. It's a tool. It can be, art is used to preserve great esoteric knowledge, great wisdom throughout the ages, great time periods, you know, even some of the most uh, historical um, relevant things in our history comes from understanding the, the art of that culture. So if you look at the Greek culture, you can tell what kind of mindset is going on be, because of the art that's taking place in that culture at that time period. You know, is it degenerate? Is it degenerating? You know, like mm -hmm. what's it trying to represent? So if you look at the art, you can really follow like the mindset of the culture itself. So, but also art can be used as a information weapon, you know, to control the society, obviously. And we see that with a lot of things. So, you know, That's I'm not great. trying to demon, I'm not trying to demonize art, by the way. I'm just saying, you know, it, it's a weapon and you can yeah. use it positively or negatively. <laughs> Absolutely. Just like, you know, I mean, art is in artificial. Artificial means man-made, but yet what is it used for, right? Artificial can align with the natural, um, right. but it, it could also be for um, for degradation of, of humanity as well. So, oh, Man, you just brought up a point. I wasn't going to bring that up, but I wanted to talk to you about that. I almost texted it to you earlier. Yeah. I see a lot of people who are like anarcho-primitivist or naturalists to such a degree that they think that all technology should be purged, right? And that there's no place for artificialness or even illusions in the world, right? Well, no, that's not true, you know? And if you do deep work and you do your own discernment, you really enhance your philosophy, you can understand that there is a place for artificial things in the world. Like you said, it's man-made, you know? We're using, we're using artificial stuff right here. The image that you're watching right now is not actually me. It's an artificial projection of me. Exactly. You know? So like there's good things for that. And, you know, I think that there's a there's a big divide with people with that. And I think people fear technology because they always fear they have this subconscious fear of becoming obsolete, you know, and it's always been throughout history. Like anytime there's a new technology, people have always feared becoming obsolete in that area. You know, so we have to understand that technology is not the issue. It's just the level of consciousness wielding the technology. And what we're doing with that te technology. So a lot of people might not like me for this, but I'm not scared of AI. You know what I'm scared of? I'm scared of AI being controlled by an authoritarian regime. I'm scared of a child system AI that's, that's developed with a military background through militarized purposes. You know, it's just like raising a child that you already have, you know, in a military family, you know, and then they become a soldier and a military. So I'm not worried about AI. I'm worried about how we're developing and how we're training and teaching those things and what we're doing with those things and what we're stimulating, what we're programming into that and what it's going to use with that, you know? So I'm not totally. really, yeah, I'm not concerned about it if I'm, I'm living in a free state. I think there can be great uses for it in a free state, you know? But a lot of people don't want to talk about that, you know? especially in the conspiratorial movements because they're, they're scared. They're exactly. scared of what that means because they have, uh, they have self-conscious issues. You know, they have um, uh, self-esteem issues when it comes to technology. Yeah. And I, and I would even say most of them are, um, are ignorant to technology. Mm, yes. Through that, through that pre preconceived notion of, uh, of anti-technology, right? They, they don't have any, any knowledge for that technology uh, in general. So I, I agree with you 100%. And even in my presentation, which was he heavily uh, focused around animism, right? Animism mm -hmm. is all about using technology, but using it in symbiosis to, to nature, the natural world, and its fellow beings. Right. Um, so I, I agree with you 100% for sure. And yeah. this is why it's so important to, to learn uh, tech right now. And that, that's why I said earlier, it is the battlefield at this current moment. That's right. That's right. Yeah. When technology is aligned with nature and natural law and it's it has the principles underneath of it, you know, we have moral philosophies underneath of it and ethics behind it, then it's always going to advance the species. You know, I am totally not wanting to go back to living in caves. You know, I think that's a horrible idea. I think it's a, a devolution, you know, devolution. So 
or a devolution, meaning like a devil, you know? <laughs> exactly. So, <laughs> yeah. We are but, lower C creators, right? We're a holographic version, right. a fractal of source, the all. So we can create. This is what humans do. Humans create. They can take natural elements and then make something artificial that can be used for prosperity, the evolution and, and connection um, with with source and nature. Right. Yeah, that's what we should be doing. And also it's an it's a pipe dream to think that that kind of ingenuity is just going to go away, you know? Like just magically, like people are going to stop creating things, you yeah. know? It's like, oh, really? You just think we're just going to become stagnant and just not create things, you know? That's what we want to do. We have a natural incentive to build things in this world. Absolutely. Yes. Even the most ancient cultures have always developed and built and advanced themselves, you know? with agriculture, with their, you know, their housing, with their society structures, all kinds of stuff, tools, you know, implements, the way that they've developed their imp implements, building their great temples, you know? So it's like, it's, it's totally, it's totally uh, ignorant when I hear that from people. I'm just like, what are you talking about? Like, if you personally want to go live in a cave, that's fine. I don't have an issue with that. But if you're trying to promote that as a societal solution, and you're not even talking about natural law with it, then I'm like, I'm stepping back, you know? <laughs> yeah, th that's just one extreme um, side of the polarity that's completely um, in imbalance. So, yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you, man. I think, um, I know we're almost coming on an hour and a half. Man, yeah. time flies, dude. I could talk to you for so long, but that <laughs> right? was a good, th that was a really good spiel. And that's a good place to, to uh, end on too, the technology bid. Real quick, um, we'll wrap it up, but any, any hopes for a future seed conference? Oh yeah. Um, I'm currently in the early phases of organizing seed five. Um, and here soon I will be putting out some, you know, information about who's going to be there and, you know, gathering speakers. And, uh, I can give you an estimate date. Uh, this can be subject to change obviously, but hopefully it's going to be a May of next year. And I always like doing it in May because I like to subvert the uh, the dark occult rituals going on during the season of sacrifice. So, you know, I'm, I'm shooting for early May if possible. So I like to do it right around that time period. That's when I've always done it, um, you know. Uh, but yeah, Seed 5, definitely in the works. Real excited for it. It's going to be awesome. You know, hopefully get you back on there, get some other people back on there. I mean, it's going to be excellent. You know, I'm ready to take what I learned from your guys' conference and put it into effect. and hopefully continue this train, you know, and keep expanding with it. I love it, man. If that, if that's an official invite, my answer is yes. Uh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Forward to it. That's <laughs> absolutely. great, man. Yeah, no, that's good to hear. And, uh, so talk about seedtruth.com. That's your main website. Yeah, that's my uh, new website. I just, uh, you know, published here the past year. That's where you can find most of my work at. You can also find, uh, my work at the Cubbyhole website, cubbyhole.com, C-U-B-B-Y-W-H-O-L-E.com. And that's uh, me and Nate Cap who do that podcast. I'm a co-host on that. We just did a really cool show on green language on there. People should check out. And then I'm on the One Great Work you know, website as well, the One Great Work Network. So uh, you can find my work there. Yeah, brother. That's awesome. Yeah, I got those links. I'll put them in the description. Um, the, the cubby hole podcast is, I mean, dude, that is phenomenal. Any viewers that have not checked it out, go to number one and just work your way all the way up. Um, shout out to Nate cap Douglas Martin's on there. And you, of course, I mean, you guys are doing some great work, man. Um, I appreciate you so much, Brandon. Thanks for coming on. And we will do more of these, these chats for sure. Cause I can talk to you for hours, brother. Absolutely. Well, anytime. And thank you for having me on again, man. For sure. My pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for tuning in. Um, and we will check, uh, you can check out my work on the One Great Work Network as well. And again, I appreciate y'all. Y'all have a good night.